Chorus. Just making sure that my camera and everything's up and working. Um, hey, Dolores, we missed you at church today. You're on mute, Dolores. You're on mute. Oh, Felipe is working. Well, Sarah was there. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he got his work permit? Um, yes, pero dile que te va el elefante. Yeah, I need a car. Yeah, he needs the card, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for uh, one month. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm trusting this all coming to line here. Um, okay. Just always take just a few extra. Whoa. Somebody joined you. Yeah, that's the dog. <laughs> that's the dog. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's an interesting graphic. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so, there we go. Okay, I was just making sure everything was working okay. And it is, uh, we may have a few people from elsewhere join us. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, do a quick hi and see if this does what it's supposed to do. So. There we go. One out of two ain't bad. There we go. Okay. So that'll just allow me to know what's going on. Um, and it worked. Good. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent. So uh, I'm going to just uh, watch you guys through the uh, Zoom, but I can see who else uh, shows up. This is a great test case because I'm going to be doing this uh, with Jordan on Thursday for my new normal program and, and we're probably going to be doing it zoom so I'm playing around with this and seeing how it ends up working and everything usually I get two out of three so um, <laughs> friend periscope did not want to join today I don't know uh, but I'm grateful for what did work um, just kind of funny the way some things work and some things don't uh, we're in Leviticus, and I'm going to be doing some screen sharing so that you guys can see the PowerPoint, which means that the other folks should be able to see the PowerPoint, too, if this works the way I want it to. Uh, we're in uh, Leviticus 15. I'm making sure that my sound's good enough for you guys to hear. Um, and so uh, we're going to be talking about some heavy stuff again, some stuff that you wouldn't even think the Bible would discuss, but it does, and it does for some very good reasons. Um, and so, uh, man, this is the stuff you don't usually get as a sermon. These are the places that pastors don't necessarily want to preach through, uh, but they need to be talked through. They need to be taught through. They need to be preached through. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I sort of like exegetical preaching because you're forced to deal with things you might not like or want to deal with otherwise. Uh, and yet they're part of the word of God and they're important parts of the word of God. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move to a screen share and see if this actually works. Um, okay, and uh, I'm gonna see if I can get the PowerPoint to screen share. Share, there we go. Oh, that works beautiful, it created the window. Now you should be able to see the PowerPoint. And Lord willing, I should be able to bring up the PowerPoint. Okay, and there it is, good. And uh, that will allow us to move further in. So let's get started here. Uh, why don't I open us in a moment of prayer? Um, and uh, hopefully this will, um, you know, I'm kind of hoping other people will tune in both from Facebook uh, where this is streamed to, and then uh, I'm giving the YouTubers a chance to kind of jump into, and I've been excited to see some of them. So we'll open with a word of prayer. Uh, Felipe uh, is working right now, or is he back yet? Nice. No, it's working. Okay, then I can pray for him at work. That's good. Yeah. Lord, thank you for the time we could get together and delve into parts of your word that you definitely meant to be there, uh, but that 
and maybe uh, any normal human writer not guided by your spirit might not want to have put in. And this is the beauty of your word. It's part of how we know it's from you because it deals with all the aspects of our life, even the parts of our life that, that are a little bit more uncomfortable. Uh, and so you are interested as we're gonna see in every aspect of our existence and how that's different than some other thinking that's out there. Uh, take us through this section, Lord, make it applicable to us, allow us to see you in it. And uh, we thank you for even the the things that we might never have talked about in a spiritual sense if you had not brought it before us. And we bring these things before you. I also think of Felipe. Um, I thank you that he is working. Uh, I thank you that he has been given the opportunity to provide. And I know that Dolores and Felipe are hard workers uh, and they like to serve you. So I pray you give him opportunities to serve you through the work that he's doing this afternoon, that you guard him and protect him, uh, and that you'd allow this to be your source of provision. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Okay. Well, let's get to our section here. Now, I'm going to make sure, because you don't want to talk about this stuff. Um, boy, I wish I could... Uh, Oh, I can move the window over a little. Oh, good. Because if I can't see my slides, uh, you may be able to see them, but that won't work real well for me. So I'm shifting this over a little bit so I can better see. Uh, you should be able to see that on your screen anyway. It's just a matter of me. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. Here we go. Uh, our, our basic take home from last week was that Jesus could create a environment of shalom. Remember, we talked about the word shalom. It doesn't just mean peace. It actually means wholeness. And so last week's take home was that Jesus could create an environment of shalom. And one day he will do that. He will create an environment of wholeness. He will create an environment of flourishing in the fullest sense possible. Now, we don't live within that physically right now. I will let you know that my daughter's given me a good book for me to read spiritual formation wise uh, that talks about examining our thinking. Uh, and so we could have a sh uh, an environment of shalom in our thinking and in our hearts and experience some of that kingdom living in the here and now. But as we look around us, uh, we don't always see shalom. And so that was the last week's. We're going to move into this week and see where things are. OK, um, this section of scripture uh, is going to deal with um, bodily functions. Uh, there's no other way to put it, um, because God has an interest um, in teaching the Israelites certain things through creation. And so he's going to go ahead and do that. Now, this is going to be a little uncomfortable um, but there's one thing that stands out in this particular section of scripture. It's that Hebraic thinking in the Bible stands in contrast to something called Neoplatonism, which entered into the church and uh, still exists a little bit around the corners. And so this is worthwhile. Uh, let me explain what Neoplatonism is and how it affects things. Plato had this idea that matter, physical stuff, okay, was bad. Okay, bad physical stuff. And that spiritual is good. So if it was made out of stuff, it was bad. But if it was spirit, it was good. Now that was called Platonism. Uh, and Plato kind of saw the world as a really, really kind of icky shadow, uh, kind of funhouse mirror of the perfect, which he believed was the spiritual. And he had a lot of ideas. But unfortunately, as you move away from the early believers who really did have some grounding in their Old Testament and were very Hebraic in their thinking, some of this Greek philosophy stuff got mixed in. Because remember that some of these church fathers were very steeped in Greek philosophy before they got saved. Now, that's not to say everything was bad, because God is, is a absolutely wonderful at using things. 
And so he used the logic of the Greek philosophers, but unfortunately the logic of the Greek philosophers was tainted by some wrong ideas they had because they didn't have the theological revelation of truth to guide their thinking. And so they were sort of out of balance. And so guys like Origen and Augustine and Clement of Alexandria adopted what was called Neoplatonism, which was a form of Platonism. And they de-emphasized the body and tried to elevate the soul apart from the body. Now, it was good that they stressed the soul's inherent immortality. That means that there's a part of us that lives on when we die. But the problem was, when you start reading these guys, their thinking was not always perfectly biblical. That's why I'm not a big advocate of if the church fathers say so. Um, and so Augustine and Origen and Clement of Alexandria, they have some good stuff to offer. Just like I'll say, even the rabbis occasionally have some good stuff to offer. Okay. But they have some stuff that's a little bit influenced here in some negative ways. And so they tended to think of the body as being bad. That's how the idea that celibacy was needed for spirituality kind of entered the church because, um, you know, let's face it, uh, you know, that, that particular part of married life is, is terribly physical. And if you don't think the physical is good and the spiritual is good, then you're, you're going to really think those things are bad. Uh, and so the, the Catholic Church got some of its ideas out of that. And Hebraic thinking stands in contrast to that. And I'm going to say Hebraic thinking in the sense of biblically Hebraic thinking. Okay, that's, that's the sort of Mideastern Hebraic thinking that existed in that area of the world informed by the revelation. And remember that God started that revelation process with Israel very early on, because even though they get the written scriptures, like Abraham knew he met with God and he could say, Isaac, you know, I met with God. And he could take Isaac out at the sky and say, you know, Isaac, before you were born, God brought me out here and look at the stars. Okay, he promised me my descendants would be as numerous as the stars. So every time, Isaac, you look up in the sky and you see the stars, I want you to remember God's promise. So the Jews did indeed did indeed need Torah, but but there was a certain amount of revelation that that was available. Uh, and so they were pretty informed by those historic events. Uh, the Exodus was a real event and they were informed by it. And so when you combine that with things that they understood from their world, uh, you understand that people in the Bible time around Jesus's time with that background uh, didn't believe that the body was bad. They believed that a person was a body and a soul. Okay. If you want to know why there's going to be physical resurrection, it's real simple because God doesn't regard the material as necessarily evil even though our creation's tainted. And so we're forever going to be physical. And by the way, here's the real shocking part. Jesus is forever got a glorified body. And if God thought that material stuff was really horrible and he was so sorry he made it, he would not have had Jesus eternally existing in a glorified body. And so this stands in contrast to Neoplatonism because God's going to talk about really, really physical stuff. And he's going to give directions for really physical stuff. And so he doesn't think just your soul is good and the rest of what he made is, is totally abhorrent. Now it's fallen. It's subject to disease. Our bodies have a sin nature. Uh, but the fact that I have two, uh, two eyes and a nose is not necessarily something God hates. In fact, Psalm 131 says that he actually knit me together. So he, he was overseeing the process, and uh, uh, the basic form that Jeff Cran has, uh, he kind of oversaw. Um, where this is important for young girls is they need to understand that they're exactly the way God made them. That they're beautiful in his sight, uh, even though they might look in a mirror and go, my nose is too long, or I wish I had the earlobes of my girlfriend, Jane, or, you know, why aren't my teeth as straight as Joni, or any of that stuff. Um, they're exactly the way God made them. Now, the problem is that, unfortunately, sin is turning my beard gray. Uh, it's giving me more girth around the middle than I would like. 
Um, but the basic design, okay, apart from sin and decay and all that stuff, is not a bad set. So now we get into this stuff, and I, I'm going to have to talk about real life because God's talking about real life here. Real life, the way it looked for these guys uh, and, and what it's all about. So uh, it's, it's going to be uh, very real. Now, I'm going to take the share off for just a second here because I had all this great stuff on Neoplatonism and then I decided not to, uh, ah, I can always pull it off of, uh, I will go back to sharing. I will find a way to make it work. I, uh, I like to record these and possibly save them, but um, it'll all work out. So let's talk about this section of scripture. We're going to talk about the first part. Now, the first part deals with guys. So it's guy stuff. Then we'll deal with gal stuff. And we'll, we'll talk about a few gospel stories that this forms the background of, okay? The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when a man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this shall be uncleanness in regard to his discharge, whether his body runs with this discharge or his body is stopped up by his discharge. This is uncleanness. Um, every bed is unclean on which he who has a discharge lays and everything he sits on will be unclean. And whatever he touches, touches his bed, shall uh, his bed shall wash Sorry, whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and shall be unclean until evening. And he who sits on anything which he has sat on, who, who has the discharge, shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean. And he who touches the body of him who has a discharge uh, shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean till evening. If he who has the discharge spits on he who is clean, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean till evening. And any saddle on which he who has the discharge, you're following a pattern here, right? Uh, um, shall be unclean. And whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean till evening. And he who carries any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean till evening. And whoever, whosoever the one who has the discharge touches and has not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean. Okay, there's a lot of overlap here. And we've said in Leviticus, there's going to be overlap. We just have to deal with it. God is making the instructions very explicit and he's repeating them a whole lot because he wants them followed. Now, it's a basic rule in Jewish thinking that emphasis, I mean, repetition is emphasis. So understand that God is making this terribly clear. And if it seems repetitive and kind of gross to us, they had to get it right. God is dwelling in the midst of them. They are his community. He has got certain things he wants. By the way, uh, nowadays, someone would say, well, well, I don't want to. Why do I have to do this? This seems gross. This seems overly picky. Why do I? But no one said that sort of stuff back then. God had a covenant. They were his people. They were expected to respond to his instructions. And if they seemed a little picky and a little precise, that was just a little too bad. Uh, I love America, but the kingdom of God is not a democracy. It is a kingdom. And we as Americans need to get the idea through our heads that while uh, our democracy forms the best form of government for human beings, um, uh, it is uh, not intended um, to uh, be a democracy. Uh, it's just the best form of government that we can have. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm going to misspell words. You know, I wish I had been, would have been nice, but um, I am just not a good typist. So I will do the best I can. And I already misspelled. <laughs> I cannot type. Okay. I use the Yoda method. So it's just the way it is. Um, there we go. So we got somebody new. Uh, and so I wanted to say hi. Um, so let's keep going. 
um, because I don't want to hold you guys up, but I I really get excited when people get to see this. Um, So that's the way it is. And we need to understand that democracy is the best form of human government, but it is not the form of divine government. God never seeks re-election, and uh, he has no intention of running a campaign. So people have a choice. And uh, we just got to keep that in mind. And so people were expected to do this stuff. Furthermore, what do I do about the furniture and the other stuff? Okay. I got a vessel of earth. Now that would be like a pottery or a clay vessel. Okay. You can't make dirt be a vessel. But understand that that clay is like dirt. And there was a lot of clay. Uh, And so you would make your vessels out of it. And if you had an earthen vessel and it touched somebody who has this condition, it had to be broken. Now, why do you have to be broken? Some things would get destroyed by water. And so the earthen vessel is porous. And we talked about this. If it's porous, it's really hard to clean out. And so this presented a problem. You couldn't, you couldn't brush this thing clean. I mean, the stuff gets in stuff. It was just considered unclean. But if it was wood, it could be rinsed. That has to do with the material. Okay. Uh, when he who is uh, cleansed of his discharge, he shall count seven days. We're going to go back to this for his cleansing. Wash his clothes, bathe his body, and he shall be clean. On the eighth day, he shall take for himself two turtle doves, two young pigeons, and come before the Lord to the door of the tabernacle. So now he's free to enter the precincts of the holy. Because remember, God actually dwelt there. So he's now free to enter the precincts of the holy. And uh, he gives them to the priest. The priest offers them as a sin offering and as a burnt offering. And so the priest will make atonement before, uh, for him before the Lord because of the discharge. If any man has, now we're getting picky here, okay? Uh, an emission of seed. Now it doesn't say seed. I'm, I'm trying to... to to make this, you know, a little bit less, nobody has to get embarrassed or red faced. Okay. Uh, we'll just call it the Bible often calls the male uh, stuff that helps with making a baby semen seed. Um, and so in, in a mixed crowd, I will just say seed. Uh, he has an emission of seed. He shall wash his clothes in water and be unclean till evening. And any garment or any leather on which there is seed. And you can open, we know what this seed is. It's not cotton seeds. Uh, she'll wash with water and be unclean till evening. And a woman who lies with him, and there is an emission of, ba- uh, emission of seed or semen, she'll bathe in water and be unclean till evening. This is going to be important because we're going to get new insight into the story of Bathsheba. So hang in there. I know this is a little uncomfortable and it sounds kind of like, you know, we're talking about kind of stuff we don't like to talk about, but it really does tie into to some other Bible stories. So you got to kind of hang out. Um, we're dealing with uh, chronic stuff here. And then we're dealing a little bit with, with something that happens with guys who are single. God has a safety valve sort of thing he built into place. Uh, and so this sort of thing happened. And so God has set up because he's dwelling in the midst of them. A procedure. Now, remember that ritual purity is supposed to picture moral purity. So uh, a man who has a normal release of seed, okay, that is not abnormal. It's not diseased. It's not wrong. It just, it happened. He didn't do anything except have a good night's sleep. Uh, He, you know, it's not necessarily sin. It's that purity has to be represented okay now we think it's really easy we say okay wow why couldn't god just say be holy and this is what holiness looks like and everyone would have got it understand that you know even when i think about holiness it's a very abstract it is it is hard to contemplate the holiness of god okay um there is his transcendent holiness and i talked about like going to visit the grand canyon and I was both like awed by the beauty and like horrified as I got near the edge. Okay, there's that sort of transcended. God is so big. And then there's moral purity. And you know what? I can't take in God's transcendence and I really can't fully understand his moral purity.
okay. I mean, Isaiah saw one glimpse of this thing in Isaiah chapter six, and he fell down and said, whoa, I am a man of unclean lips who live among a people of unclean lips. He got one glimpse of that and he couldn't take it all in. So God had to use ways of getting these ideas through that would help the people understand them. And by the way, our understanding of God's holiness in the New Testament is predicated on God doing all this stuff in the old. Okay, if he didn't make it clear to them, it wouldn't be clear to us. Okay, so he isn't just helping them. He's giving us new vocabulary here. The pagans' gods weren't holy. They were horrible. And so God wanted to make very clear because of the, the people and helping them understand and the gods surrounding them that I am not like Baal. I am entirely different than Zeus. I'm different than Hermes. I'm holy. I'm not just, you know, capable of anger. I'm holy. My anger is different. I am different. Okay. Now, any individual that touches an unclean person is automatically unclean. This is going to become important when we look at the Gospels. Okay. That includes the saddle. Uh, that includes the bed he sleeps on. Okay. As with other parts of the law, ritual bathing is always there to remove uncleanness. Okay, so we see the same ritual bathing motif. Now, I could trace this, and I did this back. We move from, from mikvah, or immersion for ritual cleanliness, to immersion for repentance. That's John's Baptist baptism, to immersion for identification. That's Christian baptism. All right? And that's the progression. So the roots of baptism... Are, are back here. Uh, we refer to it to filah or mikvah in Hebrew. Some people argue over which term should be used. Understand that in Jesus' day, there were mikvah baths that still existed because of laws like this in the Torah. I saw one that was on top of uh, Masada. They had ritual mikvah, and you stepped down in the water and you got yourself immersed. And they're still there. By the way, strangely enough, if I was unclean and I spit on someone, they were unclean too. So that's kind of the, the picture that's here. The procedure for being made clean remains the same. And we've seen it over and over again. Why did God repeat it? God wants them to know the procedure that you saw before for the house and the, the skin diseases is true for the bodily discharges, okay? Understand, if God didn't say that, they'd be wondering, well, do we do something different? Do we do something same? What do we do with this, okay? And so God wants to be very clear with them that this is the same thing, right? Yeah, as I said, uh, we went over this. Man, I remember doing an open forum on homosexuality in the Judeo-Christian view of marriage. And, you know, people would say to me, why doesn't God care what happens in somebody's bed? God cares about every aspect of human existence. Are you looking for a God who doesn't care? God is interested in our lives. That's the point. And so he does deal with this stuff, this uncomfortable stuff that's a little intimate. God enters into because he's very interested in how we live. And he's interested in all the aspects of how we live. Now, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about God's concern. Uh, and so, wow, we have a deity that's interested in, in how these bodies actually function. That's good to know if I'm praying for someone's healing, isn't it? That God's concerned about how these bodies function. And so, yeah, that is there. Um, 
why would God get so detailed about this intimacy and the reproduction functions of human beings? Okay. Um, God is the author of even this part of creation. Okay. One of the big problems the church felt, dealt with in the first and second century was called Gnosticism. And it was based on Neoplatonism. Now, one of the thoughts that some of the Gnostics had was, since the body is bad and the soul is good, I can do anything I want with my body. This is why First John is written, to deal with this sort of thinking. So people thought, well, as long as my body's sinning, but my soul is okay, I'm all right. And so John, first John is written to combat that lie. Then other people thought, well, if the body is bad and the soul is good, I need to beat my body. Okay, that's why we have monks whipping themselves and stuff. Okay, one of the things that this sort of section of scripture does is I don't have to beat my body physically and try to see if I can kill myself physically to be spiritual. It also means that what my body does affects my soul. So if I sin with my body, I've affected my soul. Now, if you think this isn't important, uh, think about the plague of pornography that's around today. Well, I'm, it's only what I'm looking at with my eyes. It's just my body, right? Now, what I do with my body affects my soul, okay? And what I do with my soul affects my body. So I'm not compartmentalized that way. What you think will affect your health. What you allow yourself to dwell on can affect your health. Your health will affect a little bit what you think. If I'm feeling... If I have a cold, it's really hard for me to study the word because, because my soul's being affected by my body, okay? Mm -hmm. God bothers about this stuff because we're one unit. We're one nephesh. That's the Hebrew word for soul. We're one unit. We're not two separate compartments. We're not Casper the friendly ghost in a machine. We're one entire unit. And so that's one of the reasons God bothers with those aspects of our lives, because he knows that our bodies affect our souls and our souls affect our bodies. He can see the interconnectedness, even when we can't see it. Also because of creation. Now, if we can get nothing else, the goal of redemption is to restore creation what creation was supposed to be. We were created to be image bearers, okay? And redemption is supposed to bring us back to that perfect image bearing state. So the goal of redemption is restoration. Well, in the beginning, he created them male and female. He created them. That's Genesis chapter one. The reason God talks about this stuff is because it's part of the cre it's connected to the creation model All right god's goal is to make their society more sanctified than it would be if he and hadn't intervened in other words they're supposed to be better than the jebusites better than the canaanites better than the the uh parasites better than the hittites better than the termites Okay, that's the way they're supposed to be. They're supposed to look different than the peoples around them. And so he tries to raise them up in the way they're living from the norm in the Mideast to a higher standard. To reflect him to those other nations. And those other nations had, had really horrible practices around this area. So God's going to regulate it. And he's going to display himself to the other nations. So where some of these laws are occurring, it's in contrast to the nations that surrounded Israel. But I don't always know what the contrast looked like because I've never spent any time as a Canaanite. But I have ideas about how horrible they were because history gives me some of that material. 
Okay. Now hang in there because while the stuff related to men does not affect very many Bible stories, the stuff related to women will give us some insight into some Bible stories. You may find yourself looking at some things a little differently. The first thing you need to know is we're going to talk about women. Guys aren't the only guns that get talked about here. God deals with men and women. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and you need to understand that there's an entire Talmud of tractate of Talmud about the women's issues. Interesting. That there's an entire tractate of Talmud where the rabbis go into major details. And to this day, the Orthodox community has mikvah baths that the ultra Orthodox or the very observant Jew will use at the end of a woman's monthly. So some of these things are still enforced among the very observant of the Jews today. You also need to understand that in that day and age, those cyclical things were not as regular as they are today. Now, I'm not going to comment anymore because I'm not a girl and I don't ask my daughters about some of those details here. Okay. But, but in the ancient world, things weren't always so perfectly normal. Okay. So we are going to talk about women. Now we have to get to the scriptures first. So we're going to use some of this language here. If a woman has a discharge and the discharge is from her body is blood. Now, remember, we've talked about blood. Blood is connected to atonement uh, and to life. The life of the flesh is in the blood, right? Leviticus 17, 11. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, but blood was a very important symbol. And if she should have a discharge of blood, which could be normative or non-normative, she set apart for seven days. And again, whoever touches her shall be unclean. Everything that she lies uh, on during that impurity will be unclean. Same thing. Anything she sits on, you can see from the verse, whatever she touches her bed, okay, whoever uh, will be unclean. Whoever touches anything that sat on it will wash their clothes and bathe in water. So you touch the bed, you touch her, you touch anything that touches her. You get the idea? Okay. Uh, notice the he's. Any man that lies with her at all so that her impurity is on him, he will be unclean. Seven days and every bed in which he lies will be unclean. Now, let me be very clear about this. This is uncomfortable, but this would happen occasionally. But a man was not allowed to be with his wife during her cycle period. And that was actually going on. It was considered uh, wrong. This is an inadvertent thing. Now we get to a Bible story that you're going to see differently. I used to read this and think, wow, that Bathsheba gal, she was like a really real seductress. And she obviously wanted to trip David up. And what is with this woman? So let me show this to you. And we're going to take this in a different light. And, and I hope you'll appreciate this. This isn't something I came up with. I had to look at this again when someone raised this with me. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to war that David sent Jacob. I sorry, sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon. Those would be the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened. One evening, David arose from his bed and walked to the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And so David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her and she came into it and lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and turned to her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am with child. Now, this is a familiar story, but we need to ask ourselves, well, first of all, we ask why it's, why it's in there. Uh, Michael Radelnik, Dr. Michael Radelnik, and others would point out that the reason this story is in there is that David is a prototype of the Messiah, but he is not the Messiah himself. 
And so this story and the stories that tell us a little bit bad about David show that while David was the prototype for the eventual messianic king, he was not the perfect messianic king. In other words, David wasn't him. That's the message you should get. Hi, I'm reading about David. It's not just to make David look bad. It's to send a message to Israel. Keep waiting. And so that's why this is. Now, why is this story going on here? Well, it's the spring of the year. And you're thinking, well, why is that a big deal? Well, one of the things is it's the time when kings went out to battle. They had like war season. Okay. I mean, some conditions are better to fight in than others. And, you know, if I was still living in Vermont during the winter and there were 16 feet of snow, uh, maybe the two armies would decide to go have hot chocolate for a while uh, until the roads were cleared and they could like sneak up on the person properly. We know that it was the time when kings went out to battle and David sent Joab and his servants and all Israel and they went and they took on the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Now, who should have been at the head of the line doing this? Well, David should have been at the head of the line doing this. A king went out with his people to war. But David says, I'm going to sit this one out for whatever reason. And he remains in Jerusalem. Now, he sent his people out to war, but he isn't warring with them. That means David's not where he's supposed to be. Not being where you're supposed to be can be dangerous because it can put you where you're not supposed to be. And then he raises from his bed because he's having a little trouble sleeping. It says evening and walked on the roof of the king's house. Now, roofs back in the Middle East and having been to Israel, they're flat. That's why he had to put a parapet around them, a fence, you know, like a, 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 a barrier so that you didn't go to the edge and fall off or kids didn't play around and fall off. And so the law commanded putting what was called a parapet which was like a fence around the top of the flat roof. Okay. Now this didn't make a lot of sense to me in Vermont because you don't do a flat roof in Vermont. That's a good way to have your, your roof cave in. So that's problematic. But out here in Arizona, we got flat roofs. We have flat roofs because we don't have snow and rain all year. And so our temperatures and climate in Arizona is more like the mid East. And so we have these flat roofs. And so David can't sleep and he goes out and he sees Bathsheba bathing. Why is Bathsheba bathing? Note the underlined line. She was cleansed from her impurity. She was following the law. She had been impure and was getting over impurity and she had to bathe herself as the law commands for her to be clean. And remember, it says you will be unclean till evening. You will bathe yourself and you will be unclean till evening. So she was taking care of becoming ritually clean again. Now, why is she doing that on the roof? Because they didn't have indoor plumbing and they didn't bathe in their houses. Mm -hmm. And so she's up taking care of herself, bathing in order to purify herself from her impurity, just as the law commands. She's doing it in the evening, so it's getting dark, so she wouldn't necessarily be seen. But David comes out there and lo and behold, he's looking where he shouldn't be looking during the time of year when he shouldn't be in Jerusalem and he sees her bathing and everything goes wonky. Now, why did I do this? Because this gives you the background of why Bathsheba was bathing. She was not probably trying to entice David. Most likely she was following the law and purifying herself of her impurity. Now, the only question you might have is why she went and went to David's place, which was not a smart idea. But remember that David is the king and saying no to the king back then was not necessarily considered a great idea. So we could question her courage. We could question her moral fortitude. But maybe, just maybe, we can't question her bathing so much. So this could be at the very heart of why she was where she was when David saw her. And this gives us background to the story. Okay. In fact, the big thing that the author points out that she was purified from her uncleanness suggests that that's why she was bathing and that she just finished her monthly cycle. And so maybe Bathsheba wasn't all bad. 
maybe Bathsheba wasn't perfect, but maybe Bathsheba wasn't all bad. Maybe she was trying to follow the law. Whatever else is wrong with Bathsheba, we can speculate about, but maybe just maybe she had a reason for being on that roof. So, uh, and this may be important to keep in mind as we look at these characters and we see what they're doing. She might just have been a victim who was following the prescription. And maybe David would have been a little bit better going out to war. You know, here's the irony. Maybe David was safer going out to war than he was in Jerusalem. Maybe the greatest dangers aren't always outside of us. Maybe some of the greatest dangers are what's inside of us. How's that for a non-take-home truth, take-home truth? <laughs> she may have been more of an innocent party than most people take home. Well, now there's another incident that surrounds these laws. Jesus had to deal with some of these ritual issues several times. He's going to deal with them again. We're in Matthew 19, 18 through 26. Now, you know, here's the problem for the Matthew folks. I'll probably be doing a little of this again. So I hope you don't mind a repetition. Uh, but this is important. Okay. Okay. I think actually I did this in Matthew already, you know, so you may have already heard some of this, but it's important because it ties back to these laws. Uh, we have a ruler comes and he worships Jesus saying, my daughter has just died. That's pretty serious. Okay. Come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Well, that's faith. So Jesus rose and followed him. And so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had an, a flow of blood for 11 years, 12 years, sorry, came up from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Um, Ma, are you still down here? I'm going to do something. Um, I'm going to walk away for just a second to grab something. Sorry about that. I needed to grab a prop. I think I've shown this. So I think I have done this on YouTube, but I want you to see it. Um, Jesus rose. So did his disciples. Suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for Now, this is not a normal. Okay. I, we, we know that 12 years is not normal. Uh, if a woman's having this sort of problem, she needs to see a doctor. Okay. And nothing's working for this woman. She's pretty desperate. Now, remember that because she's having a flow of blood for 20 years, she's richly unclean and can't join in the worship of Israel. Okay. And she came up from behind and touched the hem of his garment. She said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. And Jesus turned around and he saw her and he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that very hour. And then Jesus came to the ruler's home and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. And he said to them, make room. The girl is not dead, but sleeping. And of course, they ridiculed him. And when the crowd was put outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl rose. And the report of this went throughout all the land. Now, let's talk about this. She has a ritual purity problem that is continuing. Okay. And this is a continual problem for her. So she can't join in the worship of Israel. She is a pariah. She's an outcast. Okay. In fact, Richard Franz in his commentary on Matthew makes this point. The minstrel flow rendered her ceremony unclean. Even the touch of the edge of her cloak, therefore, was to invite an indignant rebuff from the pious Jews, as with the leprosy. Jesus ignores this taboo. Jesus ministered to people where they at regardless of what the religious folks thought. That's important for us. Who are the pariahs in our society? Now, we're not talking about okaying sin. We're talking about who we don't share Jesus with. Who, who's the lowest of the low that we don't talk about? Is there pariahs in our society? Are we willing to stop? Are we willing to minister to those who might be neglected? There is a place for that. 
during the Super Bowl, I had a dear co-worker who had a side ministry. She did more, just like Science Banner does. And she worked with human trafficking. And so she said, you know, I'm coming to town with my folks. The Super Bowl is a place where human trafficking occurs. Would you be willing to help us see if we can spot human trafficking? And I remember going out with a group of people who were far smarter than I was, who worked with this ministry in order to help see if we could take down or spot any human trafficking going around. And this is the seedy side of society. So uh, she was rendered a pariah. She was rendered an outsider. She was rendered uh, not someone you had anything to do with. Okay. And she touched the hem of his garment. Now I'm going to go ahead and unshare this for a second. Some people have seen this. Some people haven't. Welcome to the hem of his garment. This is a seat seat. Mm -hmm. This is a prayer shawl. This is a seat seat. We're going to see from the Greek that this is what she grabbed. Jews used to wear this all the time. Now it's two garments. One that's an undergarment that has the same things on it. And one that's a normal prayer shawl that's worn during prayer. But the fringes are the same on both. And this is a seat seat. So she didn't grab the corner over here. She grabbed this. So that you can see what she grabbed. Now, was it tied exactly like this? There's a little question about that, uh, about the exact timing of the uh, rabbinical injunctions. I don't have a problem with her uh, grabbing this and it being knotted much the same, okay? Now, let's talk about where I get this idea because it's not me making it up. The word in Greek is up there, kasperidon. Fringe or tassel, a fringed or tassel border of a garment. Mosaic law required a Jew to adorn his garments with four tassels. There are four tassels on this garment. Numbers 15, 38 and 39, Deuteronomy 22, 12. In the Gospels, the tassels, Kasperon, appeared on the cloak. Okay. Of Jesus. Sick people touched the tassels and were healed. The tassels also appeared in an elongated form on the garments of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, historically, it's W. Andrew Smith that is talking about this in the Lexham Theological Word Book. I happen to know it from my background and the fact that Jesus was indeed a practicing Jewish person. And I know about seat seat because I grew up with seat seat. Okay. In fact, uh, in fact, um, the Greek word seat seat is translated is a translation for two words. Now we've talked about how to use the Septuagint. I look at a Hebrew verse in the Septuagint and I find out which Greek word stands for that Hebrew word. The word kasperedon, which is the word here for fringes, is translated two different ways. Uh, when you go back to the Hebrew Bible, so when you go from the Hebrew to the Greek, there are two Hebrew words that are translated by this Greek word fringe. Okay? So these two Hebrew words, when the Bible is translated into Greek, end up being translated by the same Greek word, fringe. All right? One is the word for wings or corners. The other is the word seat seat or tassel. The Greek word for fringe in this passage is translated by these two Hebrew words when we look back at the Subtuagent. Or I should say the he two Hebrew words are translated by this Greek word when we look at the Subtuagent. Let me get the order right. We're moving from, from Hebrew to Greek. All right? Why didn't she just grab him by the collar? I mean, really. You just grab him by the midsection. You're not going anywhere till you heal me. Okay? I mean, she's desperate. This is like years of this horrible situation. I see just, you know, I'm going to just get a hold of that guy. He's not going anywhere. Okay? 
because this is a woman who's exercising faith. Look at Malachi 4.1. But to you who fear my name, the son, S-U-N, of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. I know the stall-fed calves thing doesn't make things, but it's, it's prosperous, okay? So I've still got this, right? Corner. Same Greek word as fringe. This woman's believing a messianic promise that Jesus, the son of righteousness, and this passage is considered messianic, would arise with healing in his wings. Oh, I'm going to trust this promise. This is the wing. This is the fringe. I'm going to grab it and trust that I'm going to be healed. See, faith is about believing what God said. She was believing what God said. The son of righteousness would come, the Messiah would come, and he would have healing in his wings. And so she's exercising faith. And just to go ahead and point it out again, there's our word edge or wing, okay? The skirts of a mantle. And it's used in this sort of way, the corners. And again, it says that, you know, from the Orientals, we've been accustomed to at right at night to wrap themselves with their mantles. This expression was used, and it did get used occasionally for the edge of a a bed thing, but he wasn't wearing his bed and walking around. That's just kind of silly. So she believed God, the son of righteousness has come, the Davidic king, the promised one. I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab the wing and I will be healed. If I could just but touch, touch his wing. If I could just but touch his fringe, I will be healed. And she was. And that's why Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. You believed who I am and you believe what God has said about what I can do. Okay. So it's just about our hour here. Let's do the take home truth from this week. We glorify God in our physical bodies or we're not really worshiping him at all. Okay. Worship is not simply something I do in my soul. It's something I do with my whole person. That includes my physical body. That physical things are subject. There is not a sacred, separate, secular divide. Westerners compartmentalize their lives, but the Bible doesn't compartmentalize it. What I do with my body, what I do with my material things, that's worship too. And that's our take home for this week. So, uh, questions, thoughts. Uh, usually with the YouTubers, sometimes questions come up. Uh, I'm just thrilled, you know. Uh, I put up a goal to see if God would give me six more YouTube folks tuning into like Wednesday and Thursday and stuff. So, it, you know, maybe that will happen. Who knows? Got to have a goal. Mine's will shoot for something. If you shoot for nothing, you'll hit it every time. Good lesson today. My pleasure. Thanks again, Daniel. And I hope the kids stuff's going real well. I know you're busy with, with uh, BBS and everything else. Yep. Going great, actually. Thank you. Excellent. I'll close us in prayer in just a minute. Dolores, glad to hear Felipe's working. I know you'd prefer to have him around, but it's good. Uh, and so you are so faithful, Dolores. Thank you so much. Uh, and Daniel, you whenever you're not, it, when you don't have to be somewhere else, you're here. So yep, that's great. Good to be here. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Uh, thanks to the folks who are tuning in. David Cross, thrilled to have you here. Thank you for subscribing. Uh, Corinth, you, you are always a blessing. So. Lord, thank you that we have learned that you care about all of creation, that we're not these compartmentalized beings that are just uh, 
ghosts trapped in a machine, that we're whole persons, the way you designed us to be, and you are interested in the whole and totality of our lives. You want us to think right so we can feel right so that we can do right. And so, Lord, allow us to be aware. Um, allow us to use our bodies to worship you and to make the most of, of give our whole selves to you. As Romans 12.1 points out, presenting our members of our bodies as living sacrifices, no longer being conformed to this world. Uh, be with us as we continue to walk through, with you through these strange times. And we trust you to uh, bless and to move us forward. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the meeting off in just a second. I'm just going to say thanks. Someone else jumped in at the end. All righty. Bye. Um, I got to figure out how to stop this. Stop share.